Hello, good afternoon and welcome. My name is Evelyn Wen. I am a media and performance studies researcher at Utrecht University, and I recently completed my PhD dissertation studying the biopolitics of algorithmic governance. After writing so much about the darker side of technologies and how they govern us, I kept asking myself what kinds of new infrastructures we have to build so that technology can actually lead us into more open, democratic futures. Instead of mining more data, intensifying biases, or exacerbating inequalities. I'm very happy here today to moderate this panel and to think through alternative ways of designing our digital societies for a better future with all of you. In the larger trajectory of impacts work this year is the theme post-truth. The issue of trust indeed looms large under this political and digital climate. We've seen in the past few years the problems of fake news, digital misinformation, and computational propaganda cropping up in various parts of the world. Come election time, whether we're talking about the US, Sweden, or Brazil, we can't help but worry about the way people might be swayed to vote for a candidate because they're misled by what they read on the internet or by the viral messages that are being propagated on WhatsApp or Telegram. A study by the Oxford Internet Institute this year has found evidence of formally organized social media manipulation campaigns in 48 countries. In each country, there is at least one political party or government agency using social media to manipulate public opinion domestically. This raises a lot of question indeed in terms of trust and distrust on multiple levels, including towards the information that is being distributed, towards the digital platforms and the apps that we use, and of course, towards the governments and the public organizations themselves. Technology, as much as it challenges democracy and our democratic ideals, also holds much potential in helping us create better social governance. Blockchaining, for instance, has come up as an important subject in today's era because it seems to offer new ways to think about how we could establish trust through decentralized and distributed systems. Over the last few days, we've also heard many, many examples of new projects, speculative prototypes, and citizen initiatives working towards a better democratic future. In the next hour or so, I invite all of us here to put our minds together and think about the future of democracy in the age of algorithms. How can we, as engaged citizens and digital activists, reclaim our agency and take charge of our technological tools? How do we empower people and build trust among citizens, states, and private enterprises using our digital interfaces? And how do we get out of algorithmic superstructures that do not fit our democratic ethics and values? We have three eminent speakers today who come from different fields of knowledge and practices to guide us through the subject. With Arnaud Cassinet, who is one of the masterminds behind Estonia's digital governance project, Yaromil, ethical hacker, who integrates art, science, and technology in many open source community-based initiatives, and Paolo Chirio, internet activist, cultural critic, and award-winning artist who was also featured in the festival exhibition this year. I'm very excited to hear about the various projects that the three of you have been working on and how they intersect with our theme today, Infrastructures of Trust. So first, I would like to introduce Arnold Cassinier. Arnaud Cassinet is the head of public relations of Republic of Estonia's e-residency program, and he has an impressive list of experience under his belt. He was a digital strategist and communication officer for the previous French president. He has worked as an international PR consultant in Paris for politicians, governments, and corporations, as well as a business journalist in Istanbul. He's also studied and lived in Romania and Serbia, researching European integration in the Balkans and transitional justice. At the moment, he is a board member of Open Diplomacy, a Paris-based think tank, a Yes Europe Lab Fellow for civic projects and political campaigns in Europe, and a member of the Young Transatlantic Network of Future Leaders. It is indeed a very impressive list. The floor is yours, Arno. Is 
thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I would like to say thank you very much for the invitation. Um, I'm feeling great being here, actually, because uh, usually I'm much more used to uh, to conferences in which I can listen to the government side uh, or from the uh, from entrepreneurs and tech side. But it's great for me to be here because I can also learn from uh, from academics, uh, from researchers, and from artists as well. So thank you very much for this invitation. Um, I'm going to um, I'm, I'm going to briefly tell you a bit about uh, well the uh, digital journey of Estonia in building this uh, digital infrastructure, uh, and then I'm also going to tell you a bit about the the limits of such a system, and uh, and the perspective. I'm going to talk about the limits because uh, well it's Saturday. I'm not here to promote uh, the e-residency program or anything, so uh, uh, we can have a very free conversation as well. Because by definition, no model can be. Uh, perfect, of course. Um, the topic of this uh, discussion about infrastructure of trust really resonates to me because uh, in Estonia, almost everybody would tell you that they uh, trust digital infrastructure much more than they trust uh, paper-based uh, administration, for instance. Uh, so um, mostly based on the fact that uh, well, nowadays, uh, almost well, every Estonian resident or citizen has an electronic ID card. Um, and we even decided, and that's the uh, the base of uh, the e-residency program. We even decided to uh, share these uh, advantages in the system together with foreigners. So that's how we came up with the idea of e-residency. But um, nowadays, 99% um, of uh, of Estonians have this digital ID. Uh, it's been a long journey because, um, well, as some of you may know, Estonia only regained its, its independence in uh, 1991. And at that moment, the country was totally bankrupt. There was no, uh, no infrastructure, uh, no administration. Um, it's, uh, it's a small country, not too small, but it's quite a small country. But uh, um, there's only one million and, uh, and a half uh, inhabitants. So um, it, was, um, uh, it was complicated to be able to provide those, those uh, public services to the population. So that's, how, uh, that's why the, the choice of um, building a digital infrastructure uh, actually really helped the country to design and to build an administration that uh, before being trusted could first of all be efficient. It really helped the country to, uh, to build an infrastructure uh, with really low cost. Uh, it helped to save a lot of money as well. And uh, first before, uh, before building this trust, um, it was important to demonstrate this, uh, this efficiency, otherwise the population would not, uh, would not trust the, uh, the e-services. Um, nowadays, we say that 99% uh, of uh, the services are accessible online in Estonia. Um, actually, to be fair, there are three things that we still cannot do online in Estonia. Uh, we cannot get married, uh, we cannot get divorced, and uh, we cannot buy uh, any real estate. Um, it's not uh, because, of technology, uh, because of technical problems. Uh, it's just that we believe that those things are a bit too important to be done digitally. So we still believe that it's important to meet the person uh, in front and uh, and not to uh, and also not to to divorce online or this kind of things. Um, yeah, we, we don't we don't want, for instance, after a big argument, you go home and you say, okay, I know exactly what is going to um, make him or make her angry. I'm going to divorce online. But uh, those are the high uh, risk um, transactions, but apart from that, everything uh, is done digitally in uh, in, in Estonia. So before uh, before talking about trust, first it demonstrated its uh, its efficiency. This is uh, what really managed to um, to convince the population to adopt these solutions. The uh, digital infrastructure in Estonia is based on several principles, um, and first of all, there's this principle of once only. So the once only principle means that uh, the administration is only uh, is only allowed to ask, ask you once for an information during your entire lifetime. Um, if you if you give your date of birth once to administration, all the ones will never have to ask you again for the same information. Uh, this is very important because it really reduces the interaction with the administration. Uh, you don't need to spend uh, too much time giving always the same uh, information uh, because as soon as you give it, the information bef becomes accessible uh, by other administrations. 
which doesn't mean that the administrations will, the different um, administrations will not have to uh, ask you for the right to use this information, but um, but once you gave uh, when once you gave this right, then the information became accessible to other one, to other ones. Which means that uh, well nowadays we're working on a, on a um, on some innovation, which would mean that for instance when it's not it's, it's not happening yet, but this is uh, in the very very near future. When you, um, for instance, when you register, register your your child uh, just after your child was born uh, at the um, at the hospital, then directly the administration, the uh, information will become accessible to the Ministry of Social Affairs, which will unlock all of the benefits you may need um, and you may get from having a child. Which um, and automatically the information would be accessible to the Ministry of Education, which will which uh, which will send you all of the information needed. Uh, f to know where you, the school of the kid should be, etc. So everything could be done uh, quite could be done quite easily, and um, and actually you will never have to uh, go to this administration or register this information again, etc. Just by the fact that you registered in, uh, that you send this information once means that the information will be accessible by all of the other administrations. So the once only principle is uh, very 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 important. Uh, first of all, secondly, uh, digital by default, of course. Uh, actually, if you still want to use paperwork in Estonia, you, you are still able to do it. Uh, it's not, uh, I mean, you don't have to use digital solutions, but progressively more and more people uh, decided to use, uh, to use digital solutions and to, uh, to use the digital administration. So by default, every new services that is added needs to be, uh, what needs to be digital, even if you still keep the opportunity of, uh, of uh, not using a digital administration for this. Um, the transparency very important, um, and the transparency brings me to the other topic of accountability. But um, it's uh, it's very important for each citizen to know what is being done with its personal data, uh, which is why in Estonia each citizen knows exactly which administration and even which which uh, department from which administration has checked which personal data. And if you believe that it's not legitimate, then you can feel a complaint. And the, the, you can even sue the administration if necessary, uh, because it's always very important to uh, to know that. Uh, well, for instance, you don't have any public servant from uh, who would like to check the personal data of his uh, ex, for instance, or or anything. We don't want anyone to to harass or to harass a citizen. So that's why every interaction with your own uh, personal data is registered, and you know exactly. Uh, which uh, which ministry, which administration has checked uh, which personal data. This is very important because you can't build uh, trust between the government and the citizens without having this accountability, and accountability must be on the, on the two sides. The building of this um, digital infrastructure has taken quite a lot of time, actually. It was, it's been, uh, we started uh, almost 20 years ago with the uh, e-tax board. Uh, E-tax system was very very easy to implement because, uh, of course, when nobody likes to fill its taxes, uh, so uh, when you explain people that with this kind of uh, solution they will not have to spend too much spend too much time in the in filling taxes, then it's uh, it's easier for them to understand why they need to uh, use these solutions. So, but the first uh, the first three years only uh, only 20 or 30 percent of people were using uh, E-tax system. So uh, the government need, didn't force anyone to, uh, to adopt it, it's just that at some point it became much convenient and nowadays it takes only five minutes to fill its, uh, its taxes. And then we, uh, we launched the, uh, the X-Road, which I'm going to tell you a bit more later. Uh, the digital ID card, uh, 2002. So um, as I told you, every citizen in Estonia has a, uh, has a digital ID card. Uh, which goes with two PIN codes, one to authenticate yourself and one to validate transactions so that if you lose uh, your ID card, nothing can happen. But then, progressively, we uh, introduced different, uh, different um, uh, services, including iVoting system in 2005. So it has been a very long process because, of course, you cannot uh, build trust in, uh, in, only a, in only a couple of years. Uh, you need to demonstrate each time the relevance of the solutions, and you need to demonstrate that it's going to save time, money, and and um, and energy to the population. Um, and yeah, first of all, the question of efficiency is uh, is actually uh, the uh, the uh, the most important one. Uh, in 2014, we introduced e-residency, which uh, which I'm not going to tell you too much about, but uh, basically just the idea of provi providing this 
advantageous to uh, people who are actually not neither citizens nor residents of Estonia. So the uh, digital ID card, uh, very important because it's, wha it's what ensures that uh, the system uh, can be accessible from anywhere in the world. So even if I'm uh, sitting on a, on a beach in Bali, for instance, I could still vote at some elections in Estonia, or, the, or I could still create a company where I will access my, my uh, health record. Uh, so digital ID card was, uh, was a very important uh, milestone in this. Um, the X road is another very core milestone. Uh, it ensures the accessibility of, data, uh, of the data. So that's why we call it the busiest uh, highway of Estonia, uh, because actually we have always some, uh, some transactions happening there. And uh, all of the new administrations, uh, when they need to register data, then this information becomes accessible thanks to the X-Road. So uh, it means that um, 24 hours per day or seven, seven days per, wi per week, uh, you will still be able, and civil servants will still be able to access data they need to make the uh, to make the system work. Um, and actually, the the use of these solutions have been now also expanded to other countries, such as Finland, for instance. Um, the, so we have the confidentiality of the uh, of the system thanks to the ID card and the two um, the two uh, pin codes that are needed. The availability of the data. And uh, this wouldn't be complete without uh, ensuring and guaranteeing the integrity of the data. Uh, in Estonia, the question of data integrity is uh, as important as uh, data confidentiality. And uh, for this, we're using uh, a KSI blockchain technology, uh, which is yeah, blockchain technology designed by a, a company named Guartime. And uh, it's used to secure the integrity of, uh, of several um, uh, several core information such as the health registry or all of the legislative uh, system. So um, it really helped to protect and ensure that uh, there's no misuse of, uh, of, uh, of the data. So the principles of, the, of, of Estonia, as I mentioned, data integrity in Estonia is as much as a priority as the confidentiality. Um, the accountability as well is a key, and uh, this accountability means that, um, well, Usually, the traditional view is that we need to protect uh, data about uh, ourselves, we can protect privacy, etc. Uh, of course, it's extremely important, uh, even if we know that digital age uh, makes, this, makes it increasingly difficult. Uh, but also, on our point of view, and as a, uh, as a government, we believe that um, our role is also to demonstrate our relevance each time and every moment to the, to the citizens, and we cannot demonstrate this, re this relevance without uh, without being accountable to the uh, to the citizens um, transparency um, transparency I mentioned it earlier but uh, something that I forgot to mention is that um, being transparent doesn't mean that uh, you don't have any control of what you want to show what you don't want to show for instance if you are if you had an abortion you can decide that the information will only be accessible uh, to your uh, to your doctor, for instance, you don't need all of the administrations to know about it. So uh, the government in Estonia also offers to the citizens the uh, possibility to encrypt their data. So uh, each citizen can decide, and people are, ed ed are educated for this. But each each uh, citizen can decide which data can be accessible to the other administration or not. So like this, it's a very reciprocal. So governments are accountable as citizens. Um, now about the limits and the perspective about, uh, about such systems. Well, first of all, it's important to know that um, the building an infrastructure always depends on local context. Uh, there's no model that can be duplicated at the exact, in the exact same way in other countries. We always explain it when we have people talking about the Estonian model. Because digital infrastructure in Estonia is strongly linked to the local context, to the history, to culture. And uh, well, after regaining, regaining its independence in 1991, um, administration institutions might be more trusted in Estonia than uh, compared to other countries, of course. Um, I'm French, and as a French citizen, I might not trust the French administration the same way I would trust the, uh, the um, Estonian administration, uh, because uh, the history is different, the culture is different, but um, yeah, ha being in a country that is that uh, young in terms of uh, independence makes it, um, well, in this country, it's, uh, people are very proud of these independent institutions, so they tend to trust these institutions much more than in other countries, which is why uh, the local context 
is uh, extremely important. Uh, similarly, this society is extremely horizontal in Estonia. There are less inequalities than in many other countries. So, um, of course, uh, they, they have this culture of uh, transparency, which makes it easier to design infrastructure uh, that, has, um, that are linked and that are really uh, attached to the kind of uh, very core values. Um, also, um, well, yeah, we believe that uh, new social contracts can be uh, can be uh, designed thanks to this uh, infrastructure because uh, the idea of e-residency is to attract people based on these core values. So we uh, we see also uh, each other as being in competition with other digital models like the ones in the U.S. or in China, and we try to convince people that uh, having this uh, priority put on the accountability, transparency, etc., can also bring more uh, revenues to the country, more citizens, and that's how all of the uh, new programs designed by Estonia are also based on these uh, core principles. Very important thing to remember is that um, actually, even if infrastructure can give you some opportunities, such as i-voting, it doesn't mean that citizens can be directly empowered. Um, so since 2005, Estonian citizens can vote online. It's a, it's a great innovation. Uh, it's the first in the in the world, actually. However, it hasn't impacted it hasn't impacted the uh, number of uh, voters or anything. Uh, so far, only 35% of the population votes online. Um, we still have the same uh, the same uh, the same results, and uh, we don't have uh, more people voting in Estonia compared to other countries. So the fact that you give that you have infrastructure allowing you to have this uh, innovation doesn't mean that you're going to interest to make people to be interested in politics. You do not, it doesn't mean that you're going to empower them, and uh, and actually uh, it doesn't solve everything. Technology cannot solve uh, questions of um, of. Um, being interested or engaging with the population, uh, which um, which leaves uh, another um, which makes me think about another limit to the system is the question of uh, civil tech and open data because um, again we designed this infrastructure based on the principle that uh, administration needed to be efficient and respect some values, but um, still if we it doesn't solve the question of democracy. It solved the question of being efficient. It, it, it solved the question of trusting institution and administration. But uh, what we have in Estonia is that people trust the institutions much more than they would trust, for instance, the ministers, the politicians, etc. And the uh, and the young people are not more interested in politics or in democratic uh, issues uh, compared to other countries. So there are still some people, some civic activists in Estonia, who are trying to make. Uh, to build some ch to bring some changes in this regard, um, I, men I can mention one citizen initiatives uh, have fallen uh, in Estonia. But um, again, um, it means that uh, even if you might build the right infrastructure, might work for the uh, for governments that really put the question of transparency as a tra as a uh, as a core principle, then you still need to find new tools that might not be technologic at all, new tools to empower citizens and to uh, improve democracy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you Arno. Next up, we have Yaromil. Yaromil is the CTO and co-founder of Dyn.org. He is known worldwide for developing and distributing free and open source software with strong focus on peer-to-peer -peer networks, social values, cryptography, disintermediation, and sustainability. He is the leading technical architect of Decode, an EU-funded project on blockchain technologies and data ownership. In 2009, he received the prestigious Willem Flusser Award at Transmediala in Berlin. And he has led also for six years the R&D department of the Netherlands Media Arts Institute. As if Yermo is not busy enough, he also recently completed his PhD earlier this year at the University of Plymouth. The dissertation is entitled Algorithmic Sovereignty and is available open access, of course, which is in line with his work in philosophy. So do check it out if you're interested. And now over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Evelyn for this uh, amazing introduction. Well, uh, I'm honored and very happy to be back here in Utrecht for the Impact Festival. So thank you very much, uh, 
to all the team, Arion, whom I know <laughs> since quite a while, and I think it's a unique festival in the Netherlands because you really manage to mix technology with political issues, which is, I think, something that is very, very important. If you don't mind, I will move across this stage. I introduce you uh, my organization, uh, basically all these uh, great achievements that uh, you ascribe to me, they would have never been possible without a real community behind. And now we are talking about more communities. So I'm part of a team. We have a, a place in Amsterdam. We work actively as a think-do tank on actual community development. Our methodology really starts from real needs. We develop software not because it sells, Unfortunately, the software in, in industry basically only analyzes how much profit you can do on a software before going and doing it. We do the opposite. We see how many people need it, how many people is, is ready to fight for it, to maintain, to learn, to appropriate this technology, to translate it into their own context. And we operate since quite a long time, so we are very transgenerational. And that's also another value besides diversity. Of course, gender is very important in the ICT, but also generational diversity. We have members of the community that are, come from the ham radio time. So even the BBS was the sort of infrastructure I myself uh, introduced, uh, was introduced uh, uh, in networking. But we have people that even operated on networks even before the BBS. And let me remind you, BBS has existed before the internet. So we're talking about a, a long time span. And uh, we get involved in a lot of uh, projects. Uh, the thesis that I worked on uh, for, for this sort of, of academic uh, achievement is titled Algorithmic Sovereignty. And right after accomplishing this with a practice-led dissertation, I uh, started uh, gathering uh, all the good researchers, just like Evelyn, that today she's featured on the trial with, with a research about algorithms, uh, that are actually looking into this topic. This topic, let me tell you, is a very hot topic. Uh, just today I heard the Tim Cook talk on TechCrunch about how algorithms and data should be treated uh, ethically. Of course, if a company like Apple, if a multinational corporation like Apple jumps on a topic, it's because they see money uh, to be done with it. And uh, I, what I think we should do is not money with this sort of topic, but raise awareness and especially talk to our policymakers, to our governments, to our communities on how it's important to actually have a condition of sovereignty on the algorithms that we use, and that sooner or later we will get used by. So this, um, maybe I have to get closer, yeah. So, so yes, I mentioned using algorithms, but nowadays we are mostly being used by algorithms. And this is just an example and a metaphor, an old one, of the mechanical Turk which is also the branding for a service that is used by Amazon called Mechanical Turk. And the subtitle is Artificial Artificial Intelligence. I'm not sure they kept it still as a subtitle. But this means that uh, it's using humans to fill a gap that will be later filled up by machines. So the human is almost a marginality into this equation. So it's projected in the future that we will be substituted. This is the dominant discourse about this. We have Kurzweil, all sorts of transhumanists actually dreaming of a world in which humans live forever and have no job because they go get substituted by machines. I think it's quite dysfunctional as a, as a sort of uh, uh, panorama that we have in front. But it's also dysfunctional to think that we will actually serve the operations of machines without knowing what is really inside them, what is this operation for, and who benefits from it. It. This is another example, a very concrete example of application, is the ESP game. And this was uh, theorized by von Hahn as a, as a research in academia, and then immediately adopted, he was hired by Google, into what we know as reCAPTCHA. So this is just uh, the ESP approach is, uh, is a sort of gaming, uh, gamification approach that uh, basically modularizes a problem and makes it into many 
many little solvable solutions that uh, humans can even find enjoyable to solve without even knowing what it is that for. Now, some researchers in ethics rightfully noted uh, about this kind of technologies that in some future, I mean already in the present, we can actually modularize problems of circuitry design. So we can have an electronic circuit that uh, uh, can be actually tested and designed through a game that separates all the little tasks into yeah, these little screens and games that you can solve, puzzles. And he noted that these puzzles could be even solved. Uh, uh, it was noted that these puzzles uh, could be even solved by kids. Now, the ethical conundrum here is that electronic circuitry is also used for ballistic missiles nowadays. And the military industrial complex is very big and, of course, has more money to develop these sort of systems. So how do you envision a future in which your kid will be playing with a game that will actually inform a military system to actually hit the target more efficiently and uh, use uh, weapons of mass destruction in many cases, uh, unfortunately? So I think that uh, we have to place ourselves at the, in a place of discussion, uh, of philosophical discussion about these developments. We have to focus on the purpose of these developments, on the conditions of sovereignty for humans to actually be in charge of them. And we should also look at the past, because the past has always good examples. What is a system that actually grants sovereignty to its users? I like to say that the simple mail transport protocol was one of the systems. It was a protocol that was designed to be decentralized. You could run your own server and you could have your emails at home. Some of us still do it. Uh, we have our own server at Dyne and I can tell you it's very hard to keep it up because there is a whole blockage, a worldwide blockage of mails that are not flowing through the major platforms. So this was a protocol that was designed to be decentralized, designed to not be controlled by a central entity because emails are very important and I think we still use them in virtue of this protocol, but somehow something made it very problematic to keep having a decentralized infrastructure for email. And, uh, well, I have to get closer. Uh, and that's one possible explanation. Basically, the quality of signal that flows through very open systems, distributed systems that offer an open access, becomes the problem. The quality of signal of email is known to everyone as a problem spam uh, because, of course, people take advantage of this open system, start shooting emails inside it, and start actually filling up our inboxes with unrelevant messages we haven't asked for. Now we can legislate the fact that we don't want to receive these messages, but we'll still have a lot of spam in our mailboxes. So, um, I'm suggesting that spam could be actually seen as le mal du siècle, but uh, is uh, just a symptom of the fact that all our systems, when we open them, the quality of signal and our sovereignty on who accesses our context becomes absolutely important in planning these systems. And what can we do about them? It's interesting. I'm involved in uh, blockchain technologies since the early 2010, uh, first in the first one, uh, Bitcoin Core, and then later on in all uh, what came after. I think as a technology, rather than a as a financial application, it is very interesting. And Bitcoin itself had an inspiration. It came from another software that was published earlier, which was called Hashcash. This software actually envisioned the fact that to send an email, you need to pay a computation on your computer in order to have it delivered. So there was a computational cost to be paid for every email to be sent. Cryptographically speaking, the mechanism is very similar to, the, uh, to other mechanisms that protect us from brute forcing passwords. Most password logins behind need to have a computation in order to check if the password is right or not. Without this computation, a machine could just bombard it and brute force and try 5 million passwords per second. 
So this computational cost is vital, I think, into the design of future networks. And I'm here because I would really like to inspire this audience and anyone uh, looking at this video, if it will be published, to actually engage into this sort of designs and fix a little bit what we have right now. Why? I think this quote uh, puts it very clearly. And uh, while Vandana Shiva uh, is talking about the patenting regime on GMOs, which has a similar infrastructure as the global dominating corporate uh, monopolies and oligopolies that we witness, the GMO is the genetical modification uh, uh, that is operated on, on, uh, on plants and seeds to actually enclose their usage only in the hands of a few companies in various different ways. So at this point, I think that the monoculture, the disappearance of diversity is affecting in our societies actual political and social processes. And this is also to be ascribed to phenomena like fake news that are very, very close to this sort of problematics that we are looking at. Um, I like to pose solutions and I conclude this intervention with uh, some examples of what we are doing in Europe. My organization has the luck to work uh, with the European Commission as a research organization now since five, six years. We have done three projects, we are still running two of them, and we are prepared to open a new one this year that will be announced uh, also in Amsterdam. The projects mainly focused on these questions, and we pose these questions to public officials, to municipalities. We are working with the municipality of Amsterdam and with the one of Barcelona. Municipalities nowadays know that their infrastructure is becoming very invasive. We have a lot of sensor networks on which not only public data travels. It travels data that has privacy of different levels and actually private conditions could be evinced, for instance, by a noise sensor in a square about the activity of people living nearby. So we need to ask who benefits from that? We asked the city of Barcelona and the city of Amsterdam who benefits from Airbnb? Who benefits from Uber? Now, let us decide that these companies are tax evaders, as most uh, uh, new generation uh, uh, multinational corporations, but also they do capitalize on a relational value of the data that is produced by our dense settlements. Cities have a very high speed of desires, needs, demands, and they basically put them in touch. Any of these demands, any of these scenarios actually holds a lot of value for the capital that is extracting them. Some people say that data is the new oil. I like a quote of Evgeny Morozov when he said, and then who is the next Iraq? Probably our cities, the most, uh, the most uh, uh, blinky, the most attractive cities of Europe, at least in our context, are the next Iraq. The, the cities like Venice that has lost all their population and they are very unattractive to actually live on a long term because they are completely invaded by a decontextualized crowd of, uh, of tourists. I'll stop here because I'm from Amsterdam and so I can rant for hours about tourists. <laughs> of course, it's also an economy, but um, we, we must really be careful. And probably you know in Amsterdam, Airbnb was a serious problem. The database had to be data mined because basically they are violating all the laws on housing and, and, and planning. The project is called Decode. You can look it up online. And it's uh, now almost at its uh, two years of activity. We have some pilots already running and we have technologies that are dealing both with uh, identification and both with uh, uh, data, uh, data ownership and data circulation. We are very distant from other initiatives, for instance, as the one from Estonia that was presented now. Why? Because this software is open source. I'm not sure what has been open sourced by Estonia, but knowing that the KSI blockchain being developed is half-owned by Lockheed Martin, 
a, a military industrial complex company based in the US, then I guess this will never be really open sourced. I'm very scared because I saw Gartheim being shopped in the Netherlands at the Ministry of Interior as a product that the Netherlands should, uh, should adopt. Please don't. <laughs> Don't, this is not sovereign, it's owned by an American corporation building weapons and, uh, and it's not open source. So do not trust what is being used in Estonia. We are trying to develop actually open standards with real transparency inside, built with integrity here in Europe and uh, we are quite being quite successful, although this is uh, uh, very experimental and we hope more uh, more uh, uh, organizations will actually look at. This is the sort of partners we have around our, uh, our project for now, and you can recognize, of course, symbols that are very close to us, and this is how you can stay in touch with what we do, especially for the geeks in the room. We are actually not just talking, we are writing a lot of code, so there are a couple of GitHub accounts that you can look at, and uh, tags, and ways you can get involved. This refers also to an older project, Decent, which is the project that started our, our journey in, in Europe. It's a project led by Francesca Bria, who is now city of Barcelona, and is a project that uh, uh, I like to say started around 2011, when Podemos, as a political constituency in Spain, was just emerging from the fights on the street, and actually led to the creation of what we call nowadays the fearless cities, Barcelona and Amsterdam, with the election of two mayors, Ada Colau in Barcelona and Manuela Carmena in Madrid, that had the guts to actually really turn the policy making in favor of open source. We are uh, making Microsoft out of all public uh, uh, infrastructure in Barcelona within the next two years and uh, had the, the guts to look at how to change really the infrastructure, the public infrastructure, to gain real trust from the people. But also, let me say, to gain a level of trust that can endure also a change of government. Because imagine in a completely centralized system in which you are nailed to one identity, one day you have a very good president, but the next day you have a Berlusconi jumping on, uh, on the boat and steering it. You do not want to have, in such cases, a unique identity. So my very conclusion of this talk is about down with identities. There is no single identity for any one of us. There are only attributes that we can certify, we can expose about ourselves, and we can be authenticated with. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was very interesting. Um, last but not least, we have our third speaker. Paolo Chirio, who is one of the artists um, at the Impact Festival exhibition this year. So make sure you go and check out his installation, Global Direct. Paolo works with legal, economic, and semiotic systems of the information society and investigates social fields impacted by the internet, such as privacy, copyright, democracy, and finance. He shows his research and intervention-based works through artifacts, photos, installations, videos, and public art. He's also won a number of awards, including the Glo Golden Nika First Prize at Ars Electronica in Linz in 2014, Transmediale Second Prize in Berlin in 2006. His work has been exhibited in major arts institutions all around the world, including recently the Guangzhou Biennale, Benaki Museum in Athens, MIT Museum, and Tate Modern. I'm sure we'll learn more about his practice and how Paolo explores issues of governance and democracy from the art domain today. Very warm welcome to Paolo. Hello. Um, <clears throat> Hi to everyone. I am Paolo, Paolo Cirio. Um, I am usually an artist, um, but um, people see me also um, uh, as, uh, I don't know, any form of uh, um, cultural critical um, attitude uh, toward uh, philosophy, politics, economy, and so on. 
Here I will mainly present only one project, uh, which however is connected to many other projects. It's very conceptual, it's not uh, that uh, easy and it's not that fun actually. Uh, some of my projects have uh, quite a bit of irony. Uh, this is not the case. Um, it actually uh, came out uh, from uh, um, from a feeling that I had in 2014. So the, the story is that in 2014 I was just out of this other project that was called Loophole for All. So Loophole for All is about um, global finance and how multinationals and wealth individuals avoid, uh, avoid taxes and hide um, their wealth uh, in uh, specific jurisdictions. So they basically take advantage of very specific law in very like remote part of the world to, um, you know, uh, basically fuck us over. Uh, but that's happening in other, uh, in other fields. The fact that um, it's not only finance, but uh, it's also in the case of climate change, uh, it's also in the case of privacy and mass surveillance that um, we don't have actually agency over um, these institutions or these technologies that are basically running um, all over the world, and we don't have an agency because we uh, uh, can vote only for years or every two years for our government, and we vote only for our local government. However, all these flows of information, of goods, of people, in case of tourists, uh, you know, they are uh, international, they are, uh, multi they, are, they are multinational. So uh, I came out with this idea of trying to think about a political philosophy that uh, could be a global democracy. And doing that uh, by turning globalization and technology as an opportunity. And for doing so, I um, came out with this idea called Global Direct. So Global Direct is kind of a, a political part, if you want, a political movement, but really it's just like an utopian idea. And uh, um, this is the installation here at the Impact Festival, um, where there are all the components that I will explain, but you can go to see it in the next day or even today. Uh, but um, what I was going to say is that this is really um, a form of art utopia uh, of the media and the internet art. So we, of course, know that utopia actually come from art and come from literature, uh, but in media art and in internet art, uh, there was something missing in a way. And so that's how I relate this project in terms of like creating an utopia of the internet. And uh, of course, how this is like related to politics because utopia is this. However, um, this is not about of, uh, the utopia of technology, but it's rather, uh, it, it copes with the dystopia of politics. And so it is utopia of politics that copes with the dystopia of technology. So of course we are all positive about technology sometime, not always, but uh, at this point technology is way faster than politics. And uh, uh, we don't have, again, we don't have the agency to cope with it. Um, and so, um, for maintaining democracy order over the disruption of technology, we need more sophistication in politics. And in so, more regulations with more reflexive and fast policies that can be evolved quickly. A global democracy emerged from this context, networks broke down borders. If so, democracy needs to expand beyond borders. Um, so that's what we have today. This is not an algorithm. It, it does look like an algorithm, but it's actually how law are made in this particular case in France. Um, and that's how we started this project. I started to look at how our governments works all over the world, um, um, all over the, the years. So from uh, Greece democracy, if not even before, I even look at China. Of course, China does have a, a governance. Uh, it's just a little bit more centralized than our. So um, on the website of the project, by the way, you can find all these diagrams because this was basically a research in social science, mainly. And uh, starting from this, starting from this research, I start to, um, to draw my own version of uh, 
possible utopian governance. Um, so this looks like uh, algorithms again, but they are organogram. Um, and now we are going to look uh, closely uh, to a few of them. In this case, they, they are all working together. So they are basically the bodies of uh, a govern government. Um, so we will see, but there are like, uh, uh, you know, the judiciary system, um, the, um, the, the, the legislative system, and so on. They are just like improved. And uh, nevertheless, they are rounded. And this also gives the idea that there is no hierarchy as in the flowchart that we saw before. Uh, but actually, everyone can participate in this um, as a form of democracy. And as a form of global democracy, uh, this is very the simplest. But this can tell you how uh, one person, one citizen, uh, individual should have the right to vote and take decision uh, on the local, uh, so local government, um, and so on the um, micro level, macro level, and then also on the world, continental or like a bigger um, um, territorial spaces or social spaces. Um, in this case, uh, it refers to the fact that. Um, we, we live in a, um, in a democracy where we delegate uh, our decisions to politicians, and we delegate all our decisions to politicians for years, right? So in this case, it's saying, well, we have uh, now the instruments to vote uh, more often. Um, and so in this case, uh, it shows how it's not only that the single individual can vote, but actually we have act active st uh, stakeholders proxy. And this is actually a notion coming from the Pirate Party. This is coming from the Pirate Party. And um, in this case, it's saying that basically we don't uh, delegate uh, the power to only uh, politicians, uh, but we, can, we are, don't take decision for everything, but we actually delegate stakeholders in particular issues that might know more than us and might know more than the politicians. This is just one example. Um, to go uh, through, this is another case instead where I talk about identity and I talk about accountability and responsibility and I talk about um, the privacy um, that should work in this network um, democracy. And in this case, I show how um, um, in some particular cases, we need to hold accountable citizens. Uh, in other particular cases, we need to let them be anonymous. Um, this uh, is pretty interesting because I drew this before fake news were an issue. And in this case, I really look at the information and how it's key to have very, uh, you know, factual information um, and the fact that, you know, can be uh, processed and could be, um, you know, transparent and so on and reliable. And because, of course, having uh, such good information is key to take the right decisions. We, we don't, if we don't have information, the good information that's necessary to take decision, of course, we will, have, we will make the wrong decisions. Um, this is a form of deliberative decision making and judgment. So deliberation is when basically everyone agrees uh, together on a topic, on an issue. And this happens when uh, usually uh, everyone is informed of the bad side and the good side in a very, um, in a very concrete way. And deliberation is when actually people end up to debate till they find uh, unique agreements. So this is very utopian, but it does happen in some uh, cases. Um, this is like how um, policies and law should probably be um, made in a quicker way. And uh, they should also change faster and should adapt uh, much faster uh, than we, the one we have today. So in this case, I call it a reflexive policy and rulemaking cycle with constant feedback loop. Of course, all these things could be possible with the instruments that we have today, uh, but uh, you also need uh, um, kind of like the political will to do so, and you also need the uh, engagement from people, because as um, we noticed before, even we can vote now online, people eventually don't want to vote. They don't feel engaged in that. So I also thought to have this kind of a campaign 
Uh, this is like a, a poster that eventually pasted around some cities uh, where it basically promote this idea how, um, I mean, as a, a political movements and how people should join it and be part of that. So there are a few posters and these are also in the, in the exhibition and there are several slogans uh, really as, uh, it, as it should be uh, as a political movement. And nevertheless, I, I also interviewed, I mean, I didn't really interview, these are statements uh, that uh, some uh, philosophers, um, some um, people involved uh, in uh, participatory politics of any sort uh, sent to me. Uh, so we have Douglas Rashkov, some people that have been in these ideas of uh, uh, open source democracy or participatory democracy since a long time. Um, and there are very short uh, statements when, wh where they explain how this is important. Uh, but nevertheless, um, I have to say, this is utopia. So I don't know if this is going to work, really. Uh, actually, usually, historically, utopia fails in society, especially artistic utopias fails because they are imaginary. But, um, you know, they can be dangerous sometimes. So I don't know if you ever heard about uh, John Perry Barlow. He was an artist, by the way, um, and he was the first writing, um, I mean, he was the first kind of being the, um, you know, utopians, technological utopians uh, of the internet. Uh, however, that idea produced the dystopia of Silicon Valley today to some degree because he said the cyberspace is completely independent space and should maintain the independency from any other, uh, you know, power, uh, pol I mean, political power, the government power. He didn't trust the government. You know, we are rebels, we are artists, we don't like the government. And so he said, okay, internet is finally the liberation, is the place where there's freedom. But in that freedom, the multinationals of Silicon Valley could grow, um, could, could grow this big without any kind of regulation, without any kind of law like tackling them. And this generated what we have today. The second uh, wave of utopians uh, that I would generally call uh, people that you know, believe that blockchain can you know, change the world um, in better, uh, in, there are also good projects of course, but uh, mainly became uh, you know, a dark financial speculation. Um, and decentralization has even more danger in that because there is a lack of accountability and there is a lack of uh, you know, governance that uh, needs to be uh, taken in account, taken in account. So again, it's not about the utopia of technology um, that copes with the dystopia of politics, but it's rather about the utopia of politics that copes with the dystopia of technology. And these, these also short texts that they wrote recently where I called the regulatory art, um, where I won't read all of these, but um, I think it's interesting when I say data, code, crypto, and platforms are not the law, not above it, and they should never be. And it's very key because in many of these um, um, blockchain communities sometimes, uh, they say exactly the opposite. They say cryptography is the law and uh, the blockchain is the law. But this is a very dangerous statement if you do so, uh, because of course, people makes the law and people should have you know, power over this kind of technology first. It's not the code doing it. And, uh, and, so in, and then they end basically by saying that artists should be involved in this because it requires like high level of creativity in uh, picturing this and high level of uh, you know, uh, critical thinking um, because of course there is a lot of propaganda going on and um, and we are stuck in the 19th century. We still use the same law, the same governance that we used 100 years ago. That's it. Thank you, Paolo. Please join me here. And I'd like to invite our two other speakers to join me on stage, where we'll have a short discussion. So we really look forward to having your questions. So while you're thinking about this and digesting what we've heard just now in the last hour, I'm going to start us off with a couple of questions. Shall I move over there? So
So I thought one of the things that really stood out for me was the fact that you all work on kind of different levels of these infrastructures. So from the kind of very local, right, and then Estonian government to like more regional stuff, um, like thinking about Europe in general, um, to the proposition of like a global democracy. And I was wondering how, you know, in, in your different projects, you see uh, your, the ability to uh, use these experiences and to scale up to kind of different uh, ways of creating uh, better infrastructures. So for instance, Anno, you talk about how you would trust the Estonian government but not the French. That's a very interesting difference there. And Jeremy, you're working on like cities level with different municipalities and I'm sure there are also very different scenarios um, in terms of how for instance, maybe Barcelona thinks about the smart cities and all these new projects and how Amsterdam responds to the Airbnb and, and um, the new sharing economies. And Paulo, you, your, your work has also been shown in different contexts and I'm also wondering how this idea of global democracy and what you're building uh, and, and thinking uh, through these issues maybe have different responses in the different contexts you've shown this work in. Well, I, yeah, I like that you highlight the work with municipalities. I think nowadays is very, um, is very relevant because, uh, I mean, society is also like we are growing. You know, technologies have for sure one thing they have enhanced uh, us to be very complex, to be in touch with people from the other side of the world with the same taste that we have. We became much more sophisticated uh, living beings in the last uh, 40, 50 years. Now, if we want to turn it down as an utopia or not, but I think I feel this way, we have very complex societies, and with this growing complexity, then I think that going more in the specific of a settlement of people and the specifics of the governance of that settlement is much more relevant than the nation state. So somehow I think politically we are looking at a scenario that goes into a federated thing and that's why we work with cities and I think that identities are more relevant for cities, you know, under certain conditions. And uh, my only worry regarding that, I think it's my fault, uh, what, what we haven't achieved so far is to actually address also the condition of the countryside, of the less dense settlements, because clearly in Europe there is a rift, a rift an opening rift, there are drifting continents in terms of politics between the city and the countryside. And this is very clear from polls uh, here in the Netherlands, but also in Austria and in other places. I'm sure I was spot on, but I'd like to put <coughs> some more. Uh. Uh, go, go, going back to what I said about the fact that I would trust um, the uh, Estonian uh, administration much more than the French one, it's uh, basically it's mostly ba uh, based on the fact that, um, that uh, well, thanks, we like to say it thanks to this uh, infrastructure. Um, it's better for me, to, it's easier for, for me and for other Estonian citizens to know exactly what is being done. Whereas uh, I don't, as a French citizen, I don't have many. I don't have uh, enough interaction with the French administration to understand what is being done with my personal data or uh, I'll never get to uh, have the opportunity to uh, encrypt data or to uh, to say yes or no to whose access, uh, access is or not. So that's why uh, I was saying that I would trust the, um, the Eastern administration much more and this is why uh, solutions e-solutions have been uh, have been now uh, used by the majority of Estonians. Um, having said that, again, uh, it's uh, the system has some limits, and Jaromil uh, and had pointed out some of them. I mean, all of the technology that, as a government, we use uh, are developed under public-private partnerships. So of course, it raises other uh, other issues, like we mentioned, got time for Kesek blockchain. For the X word I mentioned is another company named Cybernetica. For the uh, digital ID card, is the um, it's a Gemalto, a, fr a French company. So, uh, so it's always uh, and it's always hard from a government point of view to control uh, not only the misuse of data, uh, potential ones. I'm not saying that uh, uh, that our estimates are shared or, or anything, but even even the, uh, the the failures or even the all of the all of the security risk that can be done because the technology can always be uh, perfectible. So um, so yeah, even designing a very uh, even designing an infrastructure in which we put the question of trust and accountability as the as the main issue, it still let us vulnerable uh, to uh, all of the uh, issues related to 
technology and uh, and human or technical failures as well. Um, yes, I I present this work. I'm, I present my work in different contexts for sure. This particular one, I wish I was invited to uh, you know discuss it in a I don't know policy making discussion think tank. Uh, but in general, yes, my work tends to engage with different kind of audiences and very specific topics to produce uh, kind of like uh, actual, not change, but thinking. Um, and so, yes, uh, lately, yes, I, I work also with lawyers and I go in conference where they talk about economics or law in general, yes. But this is like very beyond, <laughs> you know, I don't think it uh, will happen anytime soon that um, the UN will call me <laughs> to talk about global democracy for sure. I think we're, we're starting to also hear about the kind of various difficulties and the challenges that, that really are present in trying to build the systems and trying to implement systems. And perhaps you guys could talk a little more about the, the kind of uh, thresholds that you have to pass um, in order to help bring these systems into really creating that um, the ideals that we are trying to achieve because we've we, we've been trying very hard and if I were to play the devil's advocate we'd say damn we haven't got so far and we're still trying to push and we're trying to build better uh, and build more uh, systems that are really accountable and transparent. So, so I'm wondering if you have more thoughts on this and how we could kind of overcome these barriers. This is, I think, uh, I take immediately the question because it really speaks uh, uh, immediately to our case. With Decode, with Decent, we have worked uh, in uh, consortia with different partners. Yeah. These are projects funded for three years from 12 to 14 partners, uh, 5 million of funding uh, each. So very complex. There is even internal politics in the project and you work with uh, bigger industrial partners, with universities, with, uh, with small groups. Like at Dine, we are like very young and activists, but we develop, no one knows where to place us. And, um, and I think one, one takeaway is that administrations, um, any organization that works in production, like a city is in production, a city is not a prototype, a city is actually running, um, is very risk adverse. And this risk adversity is usually projected as a solution. Uh, you go to big companies that give you this marketing you know, view of uh, what they do. They know how to explain it very well. And, uh, and their delivery, I must say, is usually suboptimal. I'm talking about big consultancies. They usually invest a lot into how they communicate. They reassure the policymakers that they can actually deliver. And these are the most contracted bodies usually. And I think that one takeaway we are having is that you do not need always to look for this sort of uh, uh, cool, uh, uh, smooth operators of the corporate sector to get things done. Nowadays, the scenario of development is changing a lot. There are open source communities, there are community-based developments that can be done. And in this regard, I think, for instance, in the city of uh, Amsterdam, uh, uh, there are uh, uh, many things changing. There are some small teams that work with new methodologies, agile, open source, that actually can achieve much more. So the real challenge is to convince the policymakers that actually another world of development is possible with other values. And these values are verticals that go from the development process to the actual product that you produce and to activate a real community, uh, a real community process so that you are inclusive uh, uh, contrary to most corporations, which are exclusivity is their, their uh, basically essence, and uh, they are inclusive and they actually dare, you dare to actually uh, uh, bridge uh, these, uh, these fears, um, uh, not just by becoming a fearless city, but uh, uh, really by contemplating different ways to develop things. And something so basic as free and open source software for transparency should be already everywhere. So my question is, why is not? And how do you deal with public procurement that is actually all operated by a foreign company that holds the code in a closed source way? How do you know about the algorithms that SAP 
to name one is using to actually operate the, the, the public procurements and all the, the numbers that are flowing into a city. So either these companies understand that another development is possible or what I prefer, we are going to substitute them with a new generation of developers. I, I actually agree with um, what Jao uh, has said, and uh, yeah, the question of cooperation with um, between governments uh, and citizens is one is one key. I mean, um, I think many go many governments, whether uh, city governments or others, um, understand quite uh, quite easily uh, how beneficial it can be to cooperate with corporations, for instance. But the question of uh, our citizens, and not only in terms of citizen engagement, but also uh, citizen co collaboration in uh, in solving technical uh, issues or not this topic is uh, is very often not is not really addressed um, governments understand that uh, we need to have people to vote we need to have people to participate in the democratic process uh, however having people contributing to the uh, safety of the systems or to the transparency of the systems this is uh, very often this is something that is not uh, really, uh, really take it, take it taken into account. So going back to the question about the uh, the uh, what what blocks so far. So far, we uh, so I mentioned the technical issues, uh, very important because we uh, we uh, we still depend on uh, third parties technology. Um, another important thing also is to um, tr to avoid that um, uh, to avoid the fact that uh, when when you have digital infrastructure or digital administration, you may uh, you can be very proud of the fact that your system is working well, is very efficient. At the same time, you need to be aware that it's not good if people consider themselves as consumers or uh, as customers of, uh, of your services. Um, and that's that's why I was mentioning, we get, uh, we, we, I, I was mentioning the, the fact that uh, I voting system didn't improve the participation. Uh, similarly, we have, a, we have a transparent system uh, for, the, for the parliament. Uh, every citizen can know which uh, laws has been proposed? Whose uh, who's, uh, which changes have, have been implemented? But still, it doesn't. The fact that you put it uh, in, in to the public doesn't mean that people are going to be involved in the construction of the laws and are going to uh, support it. Which is not, uh, w w which is why civic tech tech, um, civic tech initiatives, like the one I mentioned, uh, so since 2007, there are some civil tech initiatives which allow a citizen to propose a law. But uh, it, has, it was like 14 years after the uh, transparency of the uh, of the lawmaking has been uh, has been launched. So uh, it still uh, it still takes time for uh, for government to understand that uh, citizens can also contribute and not only vote during uh, during the elections. Yeah, and I think that's also the real key problem. I mean, the, again, the lack of agency. I mean, you cannot like having only having everything open source if people cannot vote to get everything open source. So it's like, after all, it's like the, the politics behind the government needs to change to make those changes, right, first. And that's though is very difficult because people are very detached uh, from politics today. For instance, if we talk about the right democracy, if you think about Switzerland, they had they, they, they have like the right democracy in favor, but no one votes, you know. Like, <laughs> so, and that's like very an issue and so there's like cultural issue, I believe. And so that I think is like goes like in different direction. It's not just technology, it's not even uh, politics only, but it's the cultural understanding of those issues, I think. I'm gonna start looking towards the audience to see if there are questions already from the crowd. Yes. Okay. Um, hello, I'm, uh, I'm Annemie Grenkenberg. I'm a concerned citizen, citizen, and I'm very interested in your talks, but also to sh I'm searching for what's lacking in your stories and what could be coming out of the combination of your stories, because of course, being male, you want to distinguish yourself a lot uh, in your talk, saying what's not right or about some countries. But I was just wondering, um, like how do you uh, feel yourself towards the present democracies we have in Europe, uh, which are still considered quite good compared to a lot of other, uh, uh, um, what you call it, uh, parts of the world. and. Uh, do you feel that your work could strengthen those democracies by kind of proposing the values you want to to, to make to make them kind of visible and possible 
So w we would have another discussion than just no big corporations or no whatever, but saying, no, we want it like this. So the principles of Esland, uh, and the, the independency of your company, and the, the making uh, do-it-yourself of, of a cereal. So, w I don't know if you gather my meaning, but I would like to hear a reaction on that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I definitely believe that uh, at least at the European level, we could benefit from this, uh, uh, at least from the from those values. Uh, if we had the as a core principle that uh, that citizens need to know what is being done with their data, at least when the governments try to access it, that would be something I would like to have it uh, generalized in the, in the, in the, in other countries as well. So um, then, of course, if bigger countries would adopt the same values and similar systems. It could also be uh, be improved and uh, and become less dependent on the, on other companies, etc. But uh, but I I uh, I seriously believe that uh, that uh, it it will allow uh, Europe as a whole to have uh, to have some alternative models that will be also more uh, focused on the protecting uh, privacy and protecting data privacy. While at the same time, and because I'm representing, uh, I'm working for a government, and what we need to have is with the efficiency and the efficient public services, I believe we can combine this, uh, this data privacy together with uh, having efficient, uh, efficient public services. And for this efficient public services, sometimes, uh, indeed, it's, uh, it's useful for the governments to access uh, data. Then, as a citizen, I want to know what is being done with it, but I know also that this is something that, is, that can be very, very efficient. If I have a car, if I have a car accident, uh, having my uh, my card with my uh, medical record in it could uh, could actually save my life because uh, the the the, um, the, uh, the hospital the do doctors would directly know what kind of allergies I may have or what kind of uh, uh, other or what kind of disease I, I I had in the past. So this uh, the use of personal data needs to be controlled, but at the same time uh, it can also provide uh, provide benefits to the uh, to the citizens as well. Then, of course, it's a question of balance, and uh, how do you balance the question of privacy uh, with the question of uh, of uh, efficiency and uh, and building a, a efficient administration? Well, of course, the question of uh, democracy then uh, comes into account because people need to be aware of what is done, and people can also decide uh, if they want to extend transparency or if they want to extend share of uh, of personal data. So it should always be up to the citizens and up to individuals to decide what they want to what they want to do or what they want to share. I just briefly I invite you really to look at the findings and the results that we have in the decode project and in a decent project because this is a positive development of course. There are concrete examples of adoption of technologies but politics first and foremost in cities, especially in Barcelona. We are talking about a movement, the Quinzo de Mayo, that was on the street, you know, fought by the police uh, for their political beliefs. And in five years, they became, you know, an institution, Ada Colau. And uh, thank you for engendering the discussion, because it's true, a, a woman leader could actually bring the positive change into such a city. It's, it's, not, it's not a coincidence, actually. And so these are the positive developments. I'm looking forward for the new administration in Amsterdam to say something leftist and actually go forward with uh, some change. While we're on this question of gender, I mean, that was a very good point. I also was a bit like, oh, wait, hang on for a second. Am I moderating, moderating a panel with three white European men? <laughs> that was a bit uh, <laughs> a, a question for me. And I thought it was um, this, this idea of inclusivity is very important. And I was wondering how the different systems that you're envisioning and you're building uh, actually has that built in place. Because for instance, Yerma, you were talking about the, uh, the idea of a transgenerational inclusivity. I think that's also an important issue to like think about right as we move into like new products and new surfaces and new designs but we also need to consider about like oh what has the, the older generations actually already have been working on that we could take out from history and re-implement yeah it's i mean this is a matter of trust legacy systems are running in production and are trusted we have people that know how to operate them and we trust these people 
this cannot just be replaced because a fancy new innovation is there. We have to look at the interoperability of progress. And this is very important and I think is one of the most dangerous uh, narratives of neoliberalism. Look at, uh, uh, you know, we had Renzi in Italy as a prime minister. Look at the prime minister of Austria now. They are young people. They are extremely aggressive towards the old. Uh, Renzi in Italy was called the rottamatore, the, 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 the thrasher. So, no, you know, like you're old, go away. Everything is new. Now we, we do new things. And sometimes I feel myself very uncomfortable because, you know, you talk about open source, these old new technologies, and you get framed immediately into that. That is a lie. You have to cope with what exists because trust is a political process. And if you come with a completely new technology that doesn't plug into what exists and you just trash some people away because, you know, they are not up to date to that, you're making a big mistake and you're jumping into a very dangerous zone in which you will be actually predated by companies that have you know, the structure and the legacy to dominate you. So that is the issue, it's very political. Yeah, uh, yeah in inclusion in your own population is something uh, indeed very, uh, very critical, um, which is why when, when we discuss about, uh, about all the system, it's uh, also extremely important to, uh, to train the, the people to teach uh, how to use digital ID card, how to access this kind of, uh, this kind of services. At the same time, as I mentioned, there's always, in our case, there's always a possibility to use paperwork, uh, si um, um, paperwork documents if, uh, if it's better for the population. But when the, uh, as, as I saw, it took 20 years uh, for Estonia to, uh, to build those uh, e-services. And, uh, and the first, one of the first things that have been done, first of all, was to, uh, well, was to uh, connect the schools from, uh, from the entire territory to internet so that more people would gather uh, in the schools, there would become some like, social uh, uh, spaces so people could spend some time there. But then also when the, when the digital ID card has been launched, uh, well, 100,000 uh, Estonians have been trained to use it. Uh, and then those people had to go to the countryside, to had to go to the uh, smaller cities in order to teach uh, other generation to, uh, to use that as well. It's, uh, it's always an ongoing process. Uh, you always have some people that are going to feel uh, left, uh, left apart, and it's, uh, it's a topic that every government has to address in, in general. But uh, in still in these uh, this issues, I would say that uh, the digital solutions can actually uh, help to, uh, to enhance this uh, question of, uh, of inclusion, because uh, it, it also helps to provide the, the, same, um, the same solutions to anyone, whether they live in big cities or, or, or not. Um, yeah, well, I think democracy it should, it, it's, it's supposed to be like about inclusivity. And uh, well, in case of global democracy, again, I think, you know, we can now um, decide or vote how much pollution China or the US is creating, but eventually we are the one affected. I mean, here, but think about Bangladesh. What is, how do we include Bangladesh in the democratic process of politics today? And they are going to die, and we keep like polluting. So inclusivity also like goes beyond this border, goes beyond gender, and it's like very like broader meaning if you look at the complexities of today, I think. Yeah, definitely. And also this issue of trust also then really you know, asks us to think through how do we include uh, a broader public. Speaking of that, a broader public, we've got more questions. Hi, <clears throat> I'm Nusheen. Um, concerning the, the topic of trust, I wondered um, what I, if you could maybe elaborate on uh, the, the notion uh, of accountability towards politicians, like how can we better hold politicians accountable for what they're promising. I think, Paolo, you had some ideas for that, but also the others. Well, I have some idea. <laughs> um, well, I mean, yeah, that's the problem. I mean, look at Trump or look at the every politicians now that um, you can hold them accountable, but you cannot get rid of them. You have to wait for ages. So you can, like, you can have, we do have accountability of that sort, but 
um, in the political scenario, the political climate of today, no, it's not really an issue. I mean, it is an issue in terms of like, but it's not an issue that you can get rid of those politicians. But in terms of like internet and technology and decentralized technology, yes, I am a little bit worried uh, about that. I was recently in San Francisco and they were having this huge conference about decentralizing the web. And everyone was very excited about it. There were all these coders, all these very you know, liberal, progressive uh, uh, organizations running it. And it felt like we were like in the 90s or when we were like even just 10 years ago and we thought that Twitter was going to change the world because it would bring like transparency and would bring like uh, uh, free speech for everyone. And now what is Twitter? It's like you know, the, the toy of Trump and we are stuck to uh, listen his voice directly without even mediation of the journalist. So I believe like, you know, like decentralization, for instance, could be like a bigger issue in, uh, in accountability because if someone, let's say, if, let's say that someone harass, uh, harass a woman, harass you, and that person is hidden in the dark web uh, behind millions of networks in the blockchain whatsoever, how do you hold accountable that person? Uh, and that's also like a cultural issue, how that person should be anonymous on those networks. And this guy is not even a politician, you know, it's just like a, an asshole. Um, but those things are happening today and they're very common, for instance. And in a decentralized web, they will be even more common and you will lose even more accountability. Um, in that particular case of harassment, but in the political scenario, it's even worse, I think. Uh, I, I believe that governments must be even more, uh, uh, even more uh, accountable. I mean, re regarding uh, being anonymous, I think it's uh, something that also needs to be protected uh, in the web, uh, even if it raises some risk, uh, but, uh, but being anonymous can be, uh, can be uh, can be a chance as well in the web. It, it must also be defended. But going back to the question of uh, of governments, uh, well, as I explained, um, we can have infrastructures that allows citizens to monitor who's proposing a law, who's voting in favor, against, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We, we we can have this. So it's not a question of uh, of transparency. Uh, it's not a question of technology. It's a it's a matter of transparency, and any uh, anyone can uh, can decide to vote. In favor or not of people who would uh, provide this uh, this kind of uh, of, uh, of transparency, um, then uh, and this is why uh, initiatives related to civic tech has bec are becoming much more important. Then it's up to the citizens also to launch to launch their own initiatives. For instance, to monitor if uh, politicians uh, decide to fulfil their, pro their, their promises or not, or to uh, to propose some uh, to propose some some laws, some initiatives. We have one in, in Estonia. But it can be done at a much bigger scale at the European level or at uh, in in other uh, governments as well. So, but this is this is up to to, um, to citizens to use the tools that have, that have been given or to create their own tools in order to enhance this question of uh, of accountability. Governments can provide the right framework, whether it's a legal one, uh, and the legal framework can be changed as well. And in the future, some uh, some some political systems may decide to incorporate. And include um, opinion more uh, include more the opinions of of the citizens, but then it's also p it's also the citizens' duty, uh, if they want, of course, it's also the citizens' duty to launch their own initiative because uh, it's not about technology. It's not about technology. We don't need a, a different infrastructure to uh, to all of this. People can decide to uh, to gather together and to uh, do online petitions or to uh, harass the government or minister or member of parliament if they don't, uh, if these politicians don't, uh, don't follow what uh, the citizens say. So, um, and, and these governments cannot help more than providing, than by providing the, uh, the right uh, legal framework and the right infrastructure, because then it's up to the citizens to, uh, to launch their own initiatives. Yeah, I was just, well, well, just want to clarify, I mean, of course there are huge potentials, but you, you have like to be ahead of the technology with politics. Mm. So to avoid that the next Trump will use blockchain, <laughs> you know, <laughs> to be the next, you know, authoritative government. That's what I even say. Because yeah. if we were ahead of Twitter, maybe we wouldn't have like Trump now. Or like, you know, this single example. But that's the stuff. Uh, 
Um, I like to point out to researchers rather than give an answer here because I understand also we are moving towards the end of the panel. Mm. And I think that about trust and especially trustworthiness, uh, as, as she puts, the work of Caroline Nevejan here in the Netherlands is very seminal. And she is currently chief scientific officer in the city of Amsterdam, besides being an academic. So she's, she will give an oratio uh, in uh, mid-November in Amsterdam that I can really recommend. And that is a framework, at least a theoretical framework, in which starting to talk about trust. And I like to quote her because also this is the topic of the panel. It's at least in the name. And um, I think that also there is art, art, uh, art has always a role in this, a very important role, I believe. And one artwork, if I remember well, was from Graham Harwood, but don't quote me on that because I may be confusing. It was shown at the Transmediale something like 10 years ago. He made an open source system with GIMP that was growing hair on the pictures of politicians, uh, MEPs in UK. Uh, that was directly proportional to the days they were not showing up at work. So you could see immediately the faces of politicians mm -hmm. covered in hair like Yetis because they were not going to work. So it's, it's just an example. I love it because it's, it's artistic and it's an intervention. Great. So with that thought in mind, let's give a round of applause to our panelists.